Luke chapter number 2, the Bible says, in other words, God said, not what man said. Verse one, number 1, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless your holy name. We're thankful for the hope of heaven. Oh Lord, uh, we long to certainly earn crowns and rewards and to get a well done so we can lay that all at your feet because we know you are worthy. And Father, anything that we attain, it's all because of the good grace of God. Now, Father, I certainly do love this time of year when the world has to stop and hear about Jesus and recognize the fact that you did come into this world. And God, I love uh, uh, the spirit uh, and the rejoicing of, of Christmas, and I, I love uh, uh, everything about it, and God, uh, because I love you, and I know the real reason that we celebrate. Now, I pray, Father, you would help us the next few minutes, uh, center our hearts and our thoughts upon you and the Word of God. I pray that you would speak and that you would enlighten people and open their minds and eyes to truth. And I pray if there be anybody under the sound of our voice who's unsaved, lost without God, that today's the day they'd repent and trust in Christ. Father, I pray if there's folks here saved, but Lord... Uh, uh, they just don't have that joy that they once had. They just don't have that desire for God like they once had. I pray today for a fresh touch in their life, and you'd restore unto them the joy of thy salvation. Use this unworthy vessel. Help us, Lord. We know every time the word of God is preached, it is received with gladness in some hearts, but there's opposition, and the devil's fighting that, Lord, it wouldn't take root in hearts that need it most. Now, Father, get glory, use this unworthy vessel, and help us this day, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want you to notice a few things about these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the assessment. We find in verse number 1, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Can I say, even in Jesus' days, you had to pay taxes. Can I say, uh, nobody likes it, but it's a fact of life. Notice it was a universal call for taxes. We know that when he came the first time, there was a one world system that called for everyone to pay their taxes. Can I say when he comes literally the next time, there'll be a one world system in place uh, where everyone will pay homage to the same government. Uh, I'm glad everything's winding down and all this is coming to pass and unfolding even before our, our eyes. Uh, and just as he literally came uh, uh, some 2,000 years ago, he's literally coming back to this earth uh, uh, one of these days, and it could be very soon. Uh, and if you're saved, you ought to rejoice in the fact uh, that he's taken us out of here seven years before he comes back, uh, and we will spend uh, 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 the rest of our days rejoicing and abiding in the abode of God. Uh, I want you to notice his arrival. Look with me in verse 6. And it was that thou, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, not pieces of cloth, and laid him in a manger. Uh, there's all kinds of cloth. Burlap's a cloth. She didn't wrap him in burlap. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes, comforting clothes. Now, it goes without saying, and, I, and this isn't the message, but uh, Mary had never known a man. She was a virgin. Read chapter number 1. The Holy Ghost uh, came upon her, and the Lord stepped out of glory and walked into her womb. 
And uh, it came to pass that while they were in Bethlehem to pay their taxes, you say, why was that so important? Why, with her being pregnant, did they have to leave from Nazareth to get to Bethlehem so the word of God be fulfilled? Micah 5, 2 said that he'd be born in Bethlehem. And he was delivered. He was born. He came into this world, my dear friends. He came in as a lamb. Next time he's coming as a lion. Lion of the tribe of Judah. But he came as God's lamb to pay your sin debt and my sin debt. We see that uh, he arrived just like he said he would. And I want you to notice the availability mm, when he arrived. When he, arrived. Uh, uh, when he came, they... They rolled out the red carpet. They opened up the palace doors. They said, the king of glory is here. Is that what happened? No. She laid him in a manger, and verse 7 says, because there was no room for him in the inn. Wouldn't you think that when God's son came that there would have been provision something better than a barn? But you see, that's the way he's always came. He's always been rejected. The important question today is, does he have room in your heart and in your life? Huh? Or do you just push him off to some stable or some barn, something that doesn't matter, something insignificant in your life? I hope that your heart's wide open for Jesus. And I hope you know him as Lord and Savior. If not, you can, because that's why he came. But then I want you to notice the announcement in verse number 10. The Bible says this, uh, And the angel said unto them, talking to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And, ye shall, uh, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angels showed up and made the announcements. Notice they didn't go to the palace. They didn't go to Herod's house. They didn't go to uh, anybody else. They went to the shepherds just to show that God's interested in everyday common man. Hmm? Didn't go to the high and mighty. He went to the lowest, the abased. And can I say, he'll go from the uttermost to the guttermost to save people. And thank God for that. Now I want to give you a little thought this morning on this. I want to preach on the first celebration of Christmas. The first celebration of Christmas. Now, if you were to poll most people, you'd say, when's the first Christmas? They'd say, at Christ's birth. I want to give you a little history lesson. Now, let me qualify this. If you haven't heard me preach here in the last few weeks, you probably haven't heard this, but let me just qualify this. I love Christmas. I love it. I love going to places and hearing songs about Jesus. I love that they dedicate a uh, whole channels on Sirius Network to the Holly Channel where you can get Holly and Jolly all day long. I love it. Uh, I love everything about Christmas. I love the Christian aspect of Christmas. The Jesus is the reason for the season. But I even love the commercial aspect. I love the fat guy in the red suit. As a matter of fact, Addie uh, came and watched uh, Sydney play basketball yesterday. Addie and Caleb and, and the Gubsters. And, and, and Addie, uh, I, I even took her and showed her Santa Claus standing in the window waving at her. I mean, I love it. I love everything about Christmas. You come to the foster household, you, you're going to bump into Christmas. That's all I'm going to say. I love it. I love everything about Christmas. Uh, 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 I, I need some more mistletoe hanging around the house. But I love everything about Christmas. No, I'm just kidding. Huh? I mean, who wouldn't love Christmas? I love it all. I love decorating. I love the lights. I love it all. Huh? Love it all. I, I get a little irritated. In our neighborhood, there's people that go all out decorating their houses for Halloween, but they don't for Christmas. I want to go, hey, what's up with that? Yeah, but I don't. I love Christmas. And I say that to qualify that because I want you to know the truth about Christmas. I'm going to do a little history lesson, but I want you to understand the very first celebration of Christmas. Can I say, first of all, most that what we know of as Christmas, this holiday that we are celebrating, everything that we've come to know about Christmas is really less than 75 years old. The vast majority of everything that Christmas has been shaped in the last 150 years, and most of it started with the, uh, uh, the poem, The Christmas Carol. Hmm? And since then, there's been songs that have come out, and there's been poems that's come out, and there's been religious things that have come out that has helped shape Christmas as we know it. But that's not how Christmas started. 
that's not where Christmas was first celebrated. Can I say this? That the celebration of Jesus' birthday dates back to 221 A.D. The early church refused to celebrate the birth dates of any of the apostles or our Lord because that was a pagan thing. Rather, they chose to rejoice in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. But the first uh, assessing of the celebration of Jesus' birthday started in 221 A.D. when Sextus Julius Africanus so-called Christianized the pagan ritual known as uh, Dies Solus Invecti Nate, which simply means the birth of the unconquered son, S-U-N. It was a pagan uh, uh, date that they celebrated in the winter solace, and that date was December 24th. That date mm, came from a pagan date of March 25th, and March 25th is when they celebrated the spring solace, and they realize it's nine months from March 25th to December 25th, so certainly that's the day of Jesus' birthday. And that happened in 221 A.D. Now, I don't want to bust a bubble. Remember, I love Christmas. Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. We just read the account, and there were shepherds in verse 8 watching their field by night. And the shepherds were not, were not in Jerusalem with their flocks in the fields in December. Jesus was probably born in late fall. But the important thing to understand is it's not important or God would have told us when he came. What is important is that he came. Hmm? But I, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm trying to give you a history lesson on the origin of Christmas and when it was first celebrated. Can I say this? It was adopted as an official holiday in 336 A.D. by Constantine in Rome. That's when the Catholics embraced it like they did other pagan things, and that's what Catholicism really is. It's a, a Christianizing or trying to adopt things that belong to Christianity into paganism. You can't go into a Catholic church and you, well, you look around long enough, you'll find a sun. That represents Ra, the sun god. You'll find statues because they were idol worshipers. And most of everything in Catholicism had its origin in paganism. Mother-child worship. That's not Mary and Jesus. That dates back to Semiramis and Tamas, uh, 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 Nimrod's wife. That goes way back. You can look in Jeremiah's days, uh, and they worship the Queen of Heaven. Uh, uh, you can look where they called her Astrid and Diana. She's been worshipped for long before Mary ever came on the scene. Hmm? Again, I'm not trying to bust her bubble. I'm going somewhere. But you need to know the truth. Can I say this? Uh, uh, the term Christ Mass was first used in 1038 when the Catholic Church had a Mass on Christmas Eve, December 24th, to celebrate the birth of Christ, and they called it Christ Mass. Of course, in Latin, it's M-A-S-S-E. It got shortened to Christmas. The first Christmas tree, officially, came about in 1605 in uh, 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 Strasbourg, Germany, when they decorated a fir tree with apples. But yet we find in Jeremiah's days, they were decorating trees in the groves with silver. Again, it was adopted from paganism. Let me qualify this. If you've got a Christmas tree, who cares? As long as you don't worship the Christmas tree. Jeremiah's days, they were worshiping that as a god. Hmm? I told you, you bump into Christmas at our house, we have three inside and two outside. Huh? I don't worship the trees, but they're awful pretty to look at. We have a travel tree. Well, the tree in our dining room has ornaments from everywhere we've traveled. 
There's three knots from St. Lucia. Hmm? Every time we go on a trip, we buy an ornament. It goes on the travel tree. In the house, in the, in the great room, we have, a, we have a new tree. It's 10 feet tall, and it has all of our personal things. It's got all the ornaments from the kids growing up and, and, and all those things, and, and it's got Mickey Mouse on the top. And I mean, if we're going to be pagan, we might as well be good pagans. we got Mickey Mouse on it. You know, we got a lot of Disney ornaments on it and all that kind of stuff. That's in the great room. Then we got another tree. Uh, 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 we just got trees everywhere. We got a uh, snowman tree. We got trees everywhere. Huh? We don't worship them, but they sure do look nice in the house. Hmm? You say, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say they was, came about 1605. Nowhere in the Christmas story do you find anything about pine trees. Hmm? So, when was. Christmas first celebrated. Well, you say, well, the shepherds celebrated here. They went and worshiped. Well, they did. But that's not the first celebration of Christmas. You see, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. The first celebration of Jesus' birth, Jesus tells us when it happened in John 8 56. He's contending with the Pharisees and the scribes. He's telling them they must be born again. He's uh, uh, done ticked them off because he said, I am and the Father are one. He's made himself as God because he is. He's the Son of God. And they're all upset at him. Uh, and they said, uh, 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 our father is Abraham. Well, this is what he commented to them. In John eight fifty six, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And was glad. The first celebration of Jesus' birth happened in Abraham's day. When Abraham, by faith, looked ahead and saw it happen and rejoiced and celebrated that Jesus was coming. So, why did Abraham rejoice? Why was the birth of Jesus celebrated by Abraham? Why is that the first uh, recollection of anybody rejoicing in the fact that God was sending His Son into this world? Why did He rejoice? Uh, why should we rejoice? Uh, why should we be excited uh, uh, about the fact that Jesus was born into this world? Can I say, first of all, He rejoiced because of the possibilities. Because of the possibilities. Without Jesus, we don't have much possibilities. We'd live our lives. Uh, we'd live it uh, 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 in drudgery and slavery to sin. We'd live it uh, uh, miserable and then we'd die and go to hell. There's not much possibility. Uh, uh, we'd have no hope. We'd have nothing to rejoice in. Uh, 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 we'd just uh, uh, have children and pass on the generation and have nothing to offer them beyond the grave. Uh, uh, but my dear friends, the possibility uh, uh, that God would send his son. Uh, hey, it caused Abraham to rejoice. Uh, in Genesis 22, 18, the Bible says, uh, and thy seed uh, shall, uh, uh, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, uh, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Uh, Abraham, uh, communing with God, uh, God said, uh, Abraham, uh, in your seed all the nations shall be blessed. Uh, the possibilities uh, when God promised that to Abraham, Abraham didn't have a child. Uh, he didn't have a son. Uh, but he rejoiced uh, in the promise of God uh, that God was going to bless him with an heir uh, and in his heir uh, all the nations would be blessed. Uh, how is all the nations blessed? Uh, because Jesus uh, came through Mary uh, and Mary came from Abraham. Uh, and my friends, you and I uh, are blessed today uh, and all the nations are blessed uh, to know that Jesus came uh, and that Jesus Jesus died for their sin. Uh, he rejoiced in the possibilities. He rejoiced in the pardon that would be available. You see, without Jesus coming, there'd be no hope for you and I. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God uh, and sin came in this world uh, and death came by sin uh, and friend, there was no hope for the sinner Amen. outside of Jesus Christ. 
You say, preacher, what about all those Old Testament lambs and uh, uh, goats and bulls that they offered up in sacrifice? Wasn't God pleased in that? Uh, uh, My dear friends, those lambs, uh, those bulls, uh, those uh, calves that were offered, uh, that just pushed back the wrath of God uh, for a year. Uh, That did not take away their sin. Uh, All of that was a shadow and a picture uh, that one day God was going to send the perfect sacrifice uh, when he'd send his only begotten son, uh, the Lamb of God uh, to take away the sins of the world. Uh, Miss Marcy, I'm glad my sins aren't pushed back. Uh, I'm glad they're not stored up somewhere. Uh, I'm glad God can't go and pull them out and remember them. Uh, I'm glad, Brother Donald, when you got saved uh, and Jesus washed in his blood, uh, your sins were gone. Uh, Hey, hallelujah. Uh, My past sins, uh, my present sins, uh, my future sins uh, have been washed by the blood of Christ. Uh, Hey, I've received a pardon in full Hey, my sins never to be remembered anymore. I've been saved by the grace of God. And all that because Jesus came. Abraham looked ahead and he realized there'll be a pardon for my sins. And it caused him to rejoice. Some of you get a little nervous when folks get to shouting around here. Why they get so excited? Because their sins have been washed away. Uh, you don't you don't mind them getting excited down at the ball game, but you get a little nervous at church when they get excited. Hey, uh, uh, the church house ought to be the most uh, exciting place you can ever come to because our sins have been washed away. I ain't got over it yet. Been forty five years. Abraham looked ahead and saw whoa the possibilities. He saw the pardon that'd be available. It caused him to rejoice. Can I say this? Abraham looked ahead and saw the promise. He had hope. You see, you got to understand, Abraham had no scriptures. He didn't have a Bible. Abraham had no sanctuary. He couldn't come to a place like this and hear about Jesus. Mm -mm. He had no fellow saints to worship with. But he had a promise. He had hope. And that promise caused him to rejoice. Hebrews 11 explains that in verse 13. He said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, uh, but having seen them afar off, uh, and were persuaded of them, uh, and embraced them, uh, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. He had a promise. He embraced it. He believed it. He banked on it. He uh, uh, lived his life by the promise of God. Uh, it caused him to rejoice. I got good news for you. If you're here today and you've got a Bible, you've got over 30,000 promises of God. And every one who has or will come to pass, you have a cause to rejoice in. Amen. He looked ahead and he rejoiced in the promise. Can I say this? Abraham rejoiced because he had purpose. Do you understand when God made the promise to Abraham, God committed himself to Abraham? Do you realize that when Jesus was born in the manger that night, that was God's commitment to mankind that you could be saved? Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. He came to to save the world. It showed God's seriousness and how much God loved His creation and how much God loved you when uh, He sent His Son to die for you personally. Abraham had purpose. Now God is committed to this thing. You know, it's one of these things when people make a a hollow promise and it never comes to pass. I've had people promise and promise and promise and promise and promise and never seen any of it. Nods, I don't know if you were old enough to remember this, but I know one preacher came down there to Ambassador Baptist Church and promised to come back to the States and send a million dollars. He hadn't got a penny of it. Hmm? A lot of people make promises. But friend, when God makes a promise... Huh? He's magnified his word above his holy name. And if he makes a promise, friend, you can take it to the bank. Huh? Mm. He's committed to this thing. Abraham rejoiced. Mm. Uh, I, I rejoice when I hear songs about heaven like Brother James just sang because I know God's uh, 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 said, Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you under myself. Hey, I've got a promise. Uh, God has committed himself to me, uh, and I can rejoice in that. Uh, Abraham did. Hmm. Can I say this? 
Abraham rejoiced because of the promotion. He realized there's something far better than this, this world we live in. And one day he gets to go to heaven. Mm -mm. What, a, what a wonderful, blessed hope that we have. If you're saved by the good grace of God, you know the grave's not the end. Uh, those that die in Christ, they, they just go to sleep. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have hope. We have the security of the Word of God and the promises of God that we'll be promoted one of these days from this life and we'll be given a body fashioned like the Son of God's. Amen. Not because we earned it. Amen. Not because of our goodness. Not because of anything we do. All because that Jesus came to that stable in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. And I say Abraham rejoiced because he had peace. Yes, now listen to me real quickly. I'll be done. Abraham was about 80 years old when God made the promise to him. He'd lived his life for 80 years just groping through life aimlessly with no hope, no assurance, and no peace. 80 years old and no heir, and when he looked around, even though he had a lot of wealth, he realized all he had wasn't enough to sustain him and that he was going to leave this world empty and void. But God intervened. And God gave him a promise. And in that promise, he received peace. And Abraham, Abraham realized he was just a pilgrim and a stranger passing through. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Now I say that to say this about Abraham. Everything that Abraham had, he put his faith in because nothing was tangible. It was all contingent on what God said, and he put his faith in it. And that's why Abraham to this day is known as the father of the faith. And my dear friends, we have been given the true Christmas story that Jesus came some 2,000 years in this world to a manger and headed to a cross. He lived a sinless, perfect life so he could fulfill the law of God and be our perfect sacrifice to God. It was important that he was born of a virgin because, my dear friends, he came from the Father. He didn't have an earthly father. If he'd had an earthly father, then he would have been a sinner like you and I. But he came, he lived a perfect life, he went to the cross, he bled and died and shed his blood to be your sacrifice and my sacrifice for sin. He was buried and rose again on the third appointed day to prove that he was who he said he was. And my dear friends, 2,000 years later, as he says, if we'll look to the cross, look to the empty tomb, put our faith and trust in his finished works and repent of our sins, he'll save us and change our lives. You see, just like Abraham, it's a faith way. When we put our faith in what God did, God will save us and change us. And my dear friends, it's that simple. So simple that even a young boy like Owen can understand it. Put his faith in what the Lord did. Be saved. We shake hands. He come up and says, hey, when can I be baptized? Huh? I said, we'll do it after Christmas, buddy. Huh? I didn't tell him he had to be baptized. Who did that? The one living inside of him. Uh, I'm just trying to help you with something. If Owen can get saved, anybody can get saved. Huh? I mean, look at him. He probably don't even have shoes on. Don't even have good sense to wear shoes most of the time. But he had good sense enough to believe on the Lord. Amen. Hmm? Amen. You say, preacher, I, I, he's just an innocent child. You don't know how wicked I've been. Well, I've got, I've got a word for you on that too. The apostle Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. He was guilty of murdering saints and, and guilty of uh, uh, persecuting saints. There was no way God would save him, but he did. Amen. And Paul said, if God saved me, he'd save anybody. But see, just like Abraham, you've got to put your faith in the Lord. Now, Abraham rejoiced looking ahead for Christ's birth. First sign in the Bible, first uh, 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 example in the Bible that we find where somebody rejoiced over Jesus coming. The shepherds rejoiced when they saw him. And can I say, anybody that ever came to Jesus, they rejoiced because he changed their life. 
But it's always been by faith. Abraham had to trust by faith. The shepherds had to believe in what the angels said and by faith went to see where Jesus was. Can I say, uh, 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 the Bible makes it clear that the pastor of the church is an angel of the Lord, a minister. Uh, and you have to believe what the Word of God says uh, and the preaching of the Word of God. If you'll put your faith in it, God will save you too. Now we're, I don't know what, 12 days, 10 days, 11 days from Christmas. Got here quick this year. Huh? I mean, it's right here. Kids are all excited, waiting to see if they got what they asked for for Christmas. Things are all shiny. I know some are struggling, still trying to get it all put together for Christmas. But it's going to be here before you know it. And you're going to get with family and you're going to open presents and you're going to enjoy all the blessings of Christmas and you're going to watch a Christmas vacation Cousin Eddie wearing the dickie under the white sweater. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, between that, Christmas vacation and Elf, I could get through the season. I watch all of them. We've watched Elf three times already this year. Him eating the cotton balls just kills me every time. I've seen it a hundred times. Uh, all the Hallmark Christmas things, they're all wonderful. It's all wonderful. But what good does it do you if you got what you wanted wrapped up under the tree, if you watched all the Hallmark stuff, if you watched Elf and Christmas Vacation, if you sang Jingle Bells till you can't sing Jingle Bells anymore, if you, if you got uh, uh, all them songs going on in your head and you can't wait to get back to listening to something besides Christmas, you got all that going on. And you don't really know the true reason for Christmas. You know why I love Christmas? Because I know the real reason, and I get to enjoy all the other stuff. That's, that's the cherry on top of the cake. Huh? But friend, everywhere you go, there's something displaying Christmas, and it's all put in your path to let you know you need to look back to that one that was born in the manger that night who came to pay for your sins. Your sins is why he came. Your sins is what put him on the cross. Your sins is why you're here today to hear about it because he wants to save you from your sins. He you said, I never asked him to die for you, for me, because you weren't smart enough. But he knew what you needed. You needed salvation. On Christmas morning or Christmas Eve or in the foster household, probably, you know, December 20th, whenever he decided to open ours. We just get to can't help it, so we get we just do it. Uh, I mean, it'll be home Tuesday, and sometime between Tuesday and Sunday, I look for a big explosion at our house. Uh, but what good would it do you to have all that and not know Jesus? It'd be kind of like this, Miss Melissa. This is what you want for Christmas. Not only what you want, what you need. This is the very thing you're hoping for Christmas. That somebody got. They wrapped it up all nice, and they say, I know you want this. Here it is. This is the greatest thing you'll ever have. This is what you need. It's a Roomba. You don't ever have to sweep anymore. Just put it down and let it go. Whatever it is. Here it is. Okay? What good does it do you if you don't receive it and open it? It could be the very thing. could be... A wedge of gold to pay the rest of your bills for the rest of your life. What good would it be if you never open it? If I stood here today and say, all expenses paid to St. Lucia, you can go see Nazareth's parents. Here it is. You stay in a five star resort, put your feet in the sand for Christmas, airfare, all your meals, everything's included. Here it is. Come get it. Well, first of all, if you don't come get it, you're stupid because that's a great place to be. <laughs> I've been trying since May to talk to them into getting married in St. Lucia. I said, that's a great place to get married, huh? Just go down there and get it done. Uh, but if you don't come and get it, you won't enjoy the blessing of it. You won't see how it can impact your life. I had no idea the first time we went to St. Lucia how that would impact our lives. And it's far more than sand and beautiful scenery. It's the people. It's impacted our lives. You would never enjoy that wedge of gold, how it would impact your life if you don't receive it. You've got to receive it. Can I say today, I'm not offering 
St. Lucia or Wedge of Gold or Ruma or anything superficial. Today the Lord says you can have eternal life. You can have life more abundantly. You can have hope and peace and joy like you don't even comprehend because your sins will be washed away and you can actually have a relationship with the very one that made you in the womb. And that's what really life is all about because when Adam and Eve sinned, that's what was lost, the relationship they had with God. And if you're here today and you're lost, you don't know anything about that because you've never had a relationship with Him. But if you'll receive what He offers, eternal life, by being willing to repent and turn from your life and accept Him as your Lord and Savior, my dear friends, <laughs> you'll get more than all your hopes and dreams fulfilled. You'll get Him and eternal life. And when life goes awry, you'll still have peace. Abraham had struggles after his promise, but he had peace. He had hope. He rejoiced because he had a promise. And my dear friends, you can, have a, you can have a promise like none other. You can have a promise of eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Today, God's got it all wrapped up in a pretty package. His name is Jesus. And all he says is you've got to receive him. But if you don't receive him, friend, it does you no good. Christmas will be nothing more than a big commercial hit to your bank account. And you'll work the next 11 months to pay for next year's Christmas. And my dear friends, it's all in vain for you. And at the end of it, You'll die and you'll have to pay for your own sins forever in hell because you didn't accept eternal life from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today you can be saved. You can understand what Christmas is really about and you can leave here rejoicing because you received the promise just like Abraham did, just like the shepherds did, and just like countless of saints have done since then. But you've got to be willing to put your faith in God and not in your abilities or what you can do. Friend, the greatest thing about Christmas is knowing Christ. Do you know him today? And if not, you can. We're going to have an invitation. You can come. We'd love to introduce you to him. Just like that angel introduced those shepherds to him, we can introduce you to him if you'll put your faith and trust him. Let's all stand, Brother Ray. Come get a song of invitation. If you don't know him, we'd love to introduce you to him. If you do know him, how long has it been since you thanked him for the greatest gift you could ever have? Him. Folks are coming. They're praying. They're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for sending the greatest gift, your son, into this world to die for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for truth. Thank you, Lord, for the day you saved me and changed me for all of eternity. Now, God, I fear in a crowd this size, there are some who might be good and wonderful people, but they don't know you. Lord, they may still think Christmas is about a lot of things other than you, and some may even know that Christmas is about the baby Jesus, but they've never trusted in you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray you'd speak to hearts right now. I pray they'd come put their faith in you and receive the promise the Lord that if any come to you you'd know wives cast them out and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved God I pray you'd save folks from their sins thank you for the ones that were saved at the jail thank you for Owen putting his faith in you God I pray now that other folks will put their faith in you and trust in the promise of God and get, get eternally saved around here today have your will and way in this invitation. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.